The game is over. The Rebels have won. Yeah! The 4th of March 1994 was one of the most important days in the history of modern Celtic, but unlike other memorable dates in the club's 136 year history, this one was far more significant for what was happening off the pitch rather than on it. It's now exactly 30 years since Fergus McCann's takeover of the club, as power was wrestled from those who had taken Celtic to the very brink of extinction. In this very special series, we're speaking with some of the key players involved at that crucial time, and on that note, I'm delighted to welcome Matt McGlone to the Celtic Exchange. Matt, 30 years on, how are things with you? Uh, good, aye, 30 years, Craig, I was sitting thinking back the other day there to some of the events because I saw the date was approaching and uh, sometimes, you know, it just seems like yesterday. Do you know, I, I spoke to you pre, pre-recording, Matt, I was 13, 14 at the time, something like that, but I still remember it. Th- this, this has been great for me in terms of bringing myself up to speed with the story and I think it would be really helpful for those who maybe know some of the story from that time and obviously you'll elaborate and, and give a lot more detail, but... Does it feel like 30 years for you? In a lot of ways, because it's it's half my adult lifetime almost. And uh, it's always, uh, I think, it was such a pivotal thing in the, the history of Celtic, you know, the, the saving of the club. Um, a lot of younger people might not think that uh, that was going to be possible, um, that a club could probably be in that amount of danger. But look what happened to Rangers. Um, so... It's something that's never really left me because of the importance of it. And it's sort of just followed me around for the last 30 years. Yeah. Will you mark the occasion in some way, as I mentioned, we are recording just a couple of days before the actual date, which is the 4th of March. Will you mark that in some way or is it just another day for no, you? No, it would just be another day for me. There's yeah. been another 29 before them. And, uh, you know, I don't believe in sort of trying to... So, what's the word? Um, make it special because it happened at the time and I'm now living in a, a different time zone. Um, obviously, I remember it very fondly, but I won't be marking it, you know. Yeah, fair enough. Um, folk of a certain generation, Matt, will absolutely remember all too well those difficult times. Uh, and it's almost become cliche, hasn't it, to talk about the, the grim 90s. You know, I don't know if it was your fanzine or another, but it was Don't Look Now, It's the 90s. You know, one of the guys kind of ran with a column of that nature. But to provide a, a bit of background, perhaps for younger fans or, or anyone who doesn't fully know the story, can you tell us, first of all, about groups such as Save Our Celts, why they came to be, and then, of course, the follow-on, which was your own group, Celts for Change? Yeah, well, the very first group um, was uh, Save Our Celts, um, run by two guys, Jim Orr, um, who's now a playwright, and has done Ben Dillett Berti and uh, Ben Dillett uh, Bratback, etc. Yeah. Really good guy, and another good guy, Willie Wilson. Um, and they were the same as us, um, they were pre-us, and uh, they had a meeting at um, Shettleson Town Hall, which I attended, must have been around about 92, I think, maybe 93, um, and I went along there and uh, listened to what was what was, what was being said, and at that time there was no dissenting voices against the Celtic board, it was a case of you just took what you got and that was it, and I think Save Our Celts uh, was one of the, well, they were the first people to sort of um, make fans aware that there was a, there was a problem at Celtic, and then obviously you know they kind of ran their course. That it didn't quite kind of materialise for them, or um, yeah, it, it didn't materialise. As I say, they were really good guys. Um, I don't know why. You know, I think once you stick your head above the parapet in Glasgow, there's a different pressure. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that applied to to those two guys, um, but it's it seemed to fall by the wayside. Uh, I was writing a fanzine at the time called Once a Tim, Always a Tim and um, a lot of our content was to do with the 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 unhappiness from the fans uh, towards the way the club was being run uh, you know, lack of money being spent on players you know, um, the other side of the city were throwing money about like it was nobody's business um, David Murray was coming out and saying for every five of you spend, we'll spend a tenner we had all that kind of scenario. Um, there was lots of stories going about that Celtic couldn't pay their bills. So when I was hearing things like that, I felt that the club's um, very structure was at stake. And uh, I began to get more involved and uh, eventually got a group together, which became Celts for Change. Yeah, and just on that, so how do you go from 
uh, you're running once a term to getting four other like-minded uh, individuals to join you and, and to create that body that became Celtics for Change? Well, the, the fanzine was very much uh, anti-board and uh, if you think back to those days, there was no internet, um, everything was done by leafleting and there was only two fanzines at the time, Not The View and, and Once A Tim, Always A Tim. And both those magazines, Jared and Barr, who did a great job with Not The View, um, we were putting out the message that, you know, that there's another voice to be heard here. Um, you have to stand up and protect your club. The club's in danger. Um, I always I always had this feeling in my mind that, um, you know, the fans held ultimate control. We always, were always put down. Uh, and the board said that's it and this is the way things work. But I think, well, if the fans are paying the money, they have ultimate control of the finances of the club, so they certainly do have a say. Um so it was round about the time, I think it's probably um, the last week of the reign of uh, Liam Brady. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brendan Sweeney, who I didn't know at the time, had been handing out leaflets, as I say, on the internet. Everything was done by leaflets when you think about today. We are on a very podcast, you know, 30 years ago. It was unheard of. Yeah. Um, Brendan, Brendan was handing out leaflets. I spoke to him afterwards uh, the following Saturday. <coughs> Um, I think we were, I can't remember who we were playing, St. Johnson maybe? No, St. Johnson on the Wednesday night. Um, and him and I had a chat and then um, I had I had made contact with Brian Dempsey at one of the Celts for Change, uh, one of the Saver Celts meetings. Um, and um, I spoke to Brendan and eventually we put an advert uh, in the paper and the advert said, if you care about your club, uh, turn up at the City Halls tonight. And that's all it said, uh, the club being Celtic, that was made obvious in the advert. And about uh, probably 30 odd people turned up and I stood up and I said, uh, my name's Matt McGloan, I write a fanzine um, called uh, Once a Tim, Always a Tim. Uh, there's a crisis at Celtic, I think the fans have to be made aware. Uh, along the lines of, <clears throat> we have to stand up for the club, um, we're in, we have problems. And that initial meeting was quite raucous. Um, you know, there were shouts from the audience, I won't use the language, but... Who are you and you know where do you come from? What are you all about? And because I think in those days, if you were to say anything against Celtic, then you were anti-Celtic, mm. and that was a difficult part because we weren't anti-Celtic. We were concerned Celtic fans trying to do our best for Celtic, but in those days, because there was such an anti-feeling against Celtic from the other side of the city, from large sections of the media, here's a Celtic fan standing up saying something against Celtic. Mm. You must be the same as them. So that was one of the reasons the banner was made. The banner was made with a lot of thought in mind. Back the team, sack the board. Yeah, do you know that takes me forward a wee bit. I was going to ask you a bit later on. Who came up with that saying? Because that saying, we are sitting recording here in uh, March 2024. There's people using that right now. And we can maybe touch on some of the current stuff a wee bit later on in the piece. But it's such an effective slogan. Do you know who first devised that? How it first came to be? <laughs> I think it might have been myself. But if it wasn't myself, it was certainly chatted at the table. Um, going back 30 odd years, we didn't think at the time it's going to be a pivotal saying. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea of getting that on the banner was to say to the fans, we're not anti-Celtic, we're concerned Celtic fans. What we're saying is back the team, sack the board. So there's two differentials there, yeah. you know, as to what the message is. So in terms of the bodies who made up Celtics for Change, as I say, there was five of you guys, yourself, Brendan Sweeney, you've mentioned, Colin Duncan, David Cunningham, John Thompson. And was there was there a set objective from the outset, Matt? Was it simply remove the current board or was there a, you know, a number of objectives? What was the, the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal was um, to find out um, how much debt Celtic were in and how dangerous the situation was. Um, so it's myself and Brendan and then I have to say the five guys in Celtics for Change I have to mention them David I know you did there but David Cunningham Brendan Sweeney John Thompson Colin Duncan these guys were total soldiers they, they really stuck to the task all of us get grief in the street all of us get grief in the house because we're away out of the house we all had families and various responsibilities and situations but we also had this focus to turn up at all the meetings so these other four guys, to me, were brothers and all going for the same thing, and they all played their own, They all played a big part as much as anybody else did. Yeah. So I, you know, I have to give them credit for that. Um, so um, the the we had we had the meeting, and then um, we put another advert in the paper, 
Um, and the first meeting was, I say, crikey, when the attention's really on you, life life became a bit difficult. Anyway, put another advert in the paper and uh, parked the car on Parnley Street, walked up Candle Rig and saw these Celtic fans queuing down the street. And my first thought was, they're all standing there with hats and Celtic tabbies and things. My first thought was, there must be another Celtic do on here because they can't be forever gig. Mm-hmm. It was only 30 the last one. And... Um, I went up to the front of the door and the guy said, get the back of the queue, mate. And I said, no, I'm just asking who this is for. And he said, oh, some some group called Celts for Change. And I said, well, it's myself, it's organisers with uh, some other guys. There wasn't there wasn't five guys at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, we get in, got the Janney and said, listen, the, the city the city halls in Glasgow has got about four or five big halls in it. It's four or five halls, big halls to sort of small to medium halls. The hall that we had hired for, I think, 30 quid, held about 30 or 40 people. This other room, which we needed probably for about 400, 450, was going to be like £180, and we didn't have £180. I said to Johnny, don't worry about it, we'll get you the money, just get us the room. And we ad hoc them and then, we we got the people into the room. Um, so, the, you, you, originally you asked me there, you know, how did it sort of form? There was different guys... Uh, who were involved at the time, who didn't see it through for whatever reason, good Celtic fans, but with different um, ideas politically. My main thing was, there's a couple of the boys who are not one of the five who had wanted a boycott within like four or five weeks. Now, I was thinking the strategy of this, uh, and I suppose the, the very first meeting was a lesson to myself that you ha- this wasn't going to be easy we had to convince Celtic fans as to what the situation was. So how could you call for a boycott, you know, within weeks when these people, when other people don't know who you are? They don't, they haven't got the confidence that we are who we say we are. Um, so I felt that to call for a boycott so early, which would be around about possibly November 1993, would be the wrong thing to do because I felt the right thing to do is we have to work hard and campaign and get the trust of the Celtic supporters so they know that we are the same as them, but we are the people who have brought this to the fore. Absolutely. And and Matt, who were the 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 incumbents of Celtic that you were campaigning so hard against? You know, the guys who had run the club so close to liquidation. Um, and why was, was there such a drive to, to remove these figures? The drive to remove the figures was because uh, I felt they were very self-serving. They um, had made it pretty clear in various chats and offhand and radio and various things, that any debt the club were going to be in, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be personally responsible. So when I heard that, I'm thinking, wow, that's very serious. Because if these people in charge of running the club, they're not taking the responsibility for getting it into debt. And if they're not going to pay the debt, then the club could be taken over. My great fear was like a financial institution or a bank would take over Celtic. And, you know, this is like 20 odd years before it happened to Rangers. We know what happened there. So the whole idea was to listen to who had money. We didn't have money, obviously. But we knew of Fergus McCann. Hadn't met him at the time. I had met Brian Dempsey. And um, we knew that there was people out there, Willie Hockey, Gerard Weisfield, Michael McDonald. They were all interested in doing something. They had the money. We had the sort of fervour on the street. Um, so that that was the main idea. The, the, there was Michael Kelly. He was the one who was pulling all the strings at Celtic, uh, and then he had people placed in various board positions. But although he wasn't the chairman, he was the main guy. Yeah, and it sounds like there was quite a lot of um, I don't know mudslinging about. You know, different things going on to try and maybe discredit you guys as a group and potentially, you know, to take on the old divide and conquer strategy by by you know splitting the Celtic camp. There's a quote here that I'll read out. Um, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with it, but from Kevin Kelly at the time. Most decent fans will be embarrassed by what Celtics for Change are doing. These rebels, these people are trying to damage the club. And is that just indicative of the dismissive feelings they had towards yourself and and other similar individuals? That was Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly's quoted there. Yeah, Kevin Kelly was uh, so far creeping about Fergus McCann in March 4th, 1994, that he ended up getting a position at Celtic. Um, Chairman Emeritus, I think it was, it was a, a made up name to give him some kind of position because at the end of the day he didn't sell out his shares um, so for him to say that about us, then it's pretty ironic that uh, he got a position at Celtic duty to us. Yeah, sounds like it 
There was also, um, I believe, false stories uh, doing the rounds that yourselves and, and the other guys from Silks or Change had benefited to the tune of something like 30k That's from right. Brian Dempsey and others to go in front of that campaign. Completely untrue, I, I believe. You can confirm that in a second. But again, was that just a, an indication of the kind of dirty tricks that were at play at the time? Well, Alec Cameron, who worked for the Daily Record, phoned me up at the time and uh, he said to me, um, is there, there's a story going about that you guys uh, were given 30 grand to run this campaign. And I said, where's that coming from? 30, you, you kidding? 30 grand to run the campaign? I says, look, we're all working class guys. We've all got families. We're giving up our time and we've got jobs to do. And yet we get an awful smear like this. And then I began to worry, I began to wonder why people are doing this because, as I say, you're, you're getting into all this stuff because you're trying to save the club. And now you're having to deal with something that you're not used to dealing with. So I phoned up Brian Dempsey and I said, listen, can, can you not find out who's doing this? Who's putting this around? And Brian said to me, See, when you're threatening somebody else's very existence at Celtic, they'll do everything to you to try and smear you. So then I'm learning about the politics. I'm a working class guy. I've got a wife and children. So have the other guys. We're having to put up with utter crap like that. Um, and then whoever was trying to put it around couldn't follow it up. We called them out. They couldn't follow it up. Uh, utter lies. And it was quite disgraceful. Because, you know, we were working class people trying to do our best for the club, having to put up with this kind of politics. Does something like that, Matt, take a bit of getting used to personally? So one minute you're just a regular Celtic fan, a guy who goes to his work, goes to the games, goes for a couple of beers, goes up the road, that kind of thing. To go from that to being thrust into the spotlight, you know, I know from, from reading your own book and different insights that all of a sudden you were, you know, in sports scene and, you know, the BBC and speaking to journalists and... Uh, you know, guys like Alex Cameron that you mentioned. How is it to adjust to being all of a sudden, to a large extent, front and centre at times? Well, the thing is, there's no manual for it. There's there's no um, nightclub. Uh, there's no night course you can go to for it. There's there's no college course you can go to for it. You deal with it, um, and I think you deal with it due to your mentality. Um, it was a real it was a real test for my mentality. It was a massive test. Uh, and it was a massive test for the other four lads' mentality as well. It was very, very difficult. How do you deal with something that you're not trained that you have to deal with and you have to deal with it there and then instantly? Um, I don't I don't know the answer to it. I, I don't know the answer to it. Is it being, pro being brought up in the streets of Glasgow that you just sort of say, no, I'm not going to be defeated here. Um, I'm just going to have to grit my teeth here. There was tears, there was joy, there was emotion. Um, there was all these facets and I, I don't know how we get through it. I, I couldn't tell you how we adjusted. We just did. We flew by the seat of our pants and we, you know, at times the heads were down and uh, there were some very difficult situations to deal with. Yeah, and, and I'm sure there were. And, and in addition to that, I'm sure you guys had to develop a fairly thick skin during those times and also, I suppose, develop a a skill for public speaking. I don't know your, your full background, Matt, in terms of how much of that you had done up until, until these meetings, but you mentioned the first meeting, 30 folks in the room. 30 folks in itself might be quite daunting for some, but you've gone from that to four or 500 to, I believe, a couple of thousand at different meetings as the time progressed. And I know that you made a point within your book, actually, that you wanted to make sure it wasn't just one figurehead at the, the top of the group that spoke, that at the various meetings you wanted to make sure all five of you had your voice at different times. Again, just similar question, I suppose, but how tricky was it for you guys to to pick up that skill set? It's a very important message and it was key that you got the right message and the right tone at different times. How did you adjust to that? Well, as I say, we adjusted to it because it, the situation uh, placed itself right in front of a very nauseous and we just had to deal with it. Uh, I remember uh, Hugh Pym, who I think is now the uh, health editor at the BBC. He's on all the news programmes. He was uh, working for ITV at the time and he was cutting his teeth up here with STV and he came up to me uh, at one of the meetings near the end and he says, Matt, he says, uh, you've got fantastic PR. He says, uh, which company do you hire to do all this? And I looked at him and I thought, he's having a wind up here. And I said, how do you mean you? And he said, well, he said, hey, the, the PR you managed to develop and keep all this going and the vibrancy and getting the message out. He said with leafleting and you know doing radio and TV. I said we do, we do it ourselves. We all do it ourselves. All the guys do it ourselves. None of us were trained to speak. When I spoke at the, the first meeting, 
um, back in September, October 1993. That's the first time I had stood up ever. I uh, had never even done it at a wedding, mm. being a best man, anything like that. And uh, I actually think it was more difficult to do it in front of 30 than it was to do it in front of 2000. Mm, I know what you mean, you know, a bit more intimate at that time, you know, yeah. than the bigger stage. But no, mm -hmm. it sounds like you've all stepped up at different times when you've had key messages to deliver. Yeah, all, yeah, all the guys, um, all the guys took their turn and I felt it was important. Um, you know, I was a spokesman for the group and sort of, maybe the so-called leader, but all the guys spoke and, and did their bit. Uh, and it was important because for them, you know, it, it couldn't be just one person because one person couldn't do this. So it was a combined effort of five. And I felt that if all the guys spoke, it, they would get the confidence going and everybody would be, when we went and chatted afterwards, said, you were great there, Colin, well done, Davey, brilliant, Brendan, you know, well done, John, whatever we could all talk about it rather than just one guy doing all the talking. Yeah, and it sounds like that was a really important part of the strategy. So around about those times, Matt, there was, I believe, two groups uh, aiming to take control of Celtic. You've mentioned some of the figures involved, but Willie Hockey, Jerry Weisfeld, Michael McDonald were part of one group, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a group fronted by Fergus McCann, Brian Dempsey, David Lowe. What was the major differences, Matt, you know, if, you, if you've got more of the detail on it in terms of what these two groups were looking to achieve and what they are proposals were um, because I presume both you know absolutely had Celtic's best interests at heart oh without a shadow of a doubt um, I mean the other group uh, which was Billy Hockey Michael McDonald Gerard Weisfeld um, they had Celtic's best interests at heart exactly the same way as everybody else did they just had a different uh, sort of business plan going towards it I remember at the Govan Town Hall meeting just prior to it uh, there was a couple of other guys involved in the group and as I said earlier they wanted um they wanted to have a boycott quite quickly. I'm going to come on to your point, but this, this is relative to it. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted a boycott quite quickly. And I said at the time, I couldn't be the leader of the group if if the idea was that they were going to have a boycott in a couple of weeks. Because I didn't believe in it. I thought the whole thing would crumble. It, it certainly would have crumbled. So the other two guys, no point in naming them, but you know, they're not one of the they're not part of the five. And they were all good people as well. Um but they just had different ways. I said I, I if these guys get their way, so do we sort of vote and sort of vote went my way that um, you know we wouldn't uh, call for the boycott just now. So I was prepared to leave or probably not be the leader, but stay in the background. Um, but the other two guys they decided to leave. So that was at the Govan Town Hall, and at that Govan Town Hall meeting, uh, I noticed Michael McDonald and Willie Hockey standing at the back of the hall, and it was the first time I had really seen sort of people who you saw on TV. <coughs> who were actually interested in doing what we were doing. Now, we had talks with Willie and, and uh, Michael and Gerard, uh, and they were good talks. And we basically said, you know, we don't really care who's first past the post here mm -hmm. because we don't have the money. You know, we are running a different campaign. We are running a fans' emotional campaign to try and highlight what's going on at Celtic. We are just punters. That's all we are. But you guys have got the money, so whoever comes in first... You know, and it, it just, the way it came around, I think the difference was that the low um, Fergus and Dempsey idea was that they had got hold of a Celtic shareholders list and they'd went round Celtic shareholders. Now, you and I, Remedy, couldn't have a Celtic share in those days. They were all given out by members of the board to their families, to their friends and giving away Christmas gifts and things like that as it turned out. Um, and then the th that treble of Low uh, Dempsey and Fergus, they then offered over the top amounts of money to buy these shares. The amount of shares they got got them into AGMs, mm. and it took off from there. I think that might have been the main difference between Willie and uh, the other two lads group, um, and I, I think that's how they got to the, the post first. But ha had it been you no know, Willie and Michael and the Gerard, then great. Yeah, I think most important, I suppose, was to a lesser extent who went in. It was more about who was being removed, Whites, Kellys and, and the other dynasties there. Um, there was a, a difference, Matt, you can maybe talk about some of the detail here, but I believe that Willie Hockey's consortium made a £3.6 million offer at one point, which was reje rejected. Uh, and Fergus McCann at some point made a, what seems to be a huge... Seventeen point five million offer again unsuccessful. Can you tell us a wee bit about both of those offers? 
Yeah, well, uh, Willie's group had made that offer, and uh, then Michael Kelly had come out and said a very made a very strange comment. He said that uh, you know the money shouldn't be going uh, into directors' pockets. <laughs> I mean, this is quite strange because it's a total you know back to front job. He said the money shouldn't be going into directors' pockets. The money should be going into the club. Well, that we had said that from the very beginning that these people who are running the club into debt shouldn't be personally rewarded. Mm-hmm. Then any money that goes into Celtic should be going into the club. So Michael Kelly, who ended up doing that, taking money for his shares of the McCann Dempsey consortium, was saying at the time when Willie had offered the money that the money shouldn't be going into directors' pockets. It, it was completely opposite mm-hmm. to what he was actually saying. Um, Fergus had come over. Uh, and round about um, had made the offer round about uh, oh, it must be November yeah November 17.5 million and uh, that was for Lock, Sock and Battle of the Club which eventually got for round about 6 million mm. um, you know a couple of months later now yeah that is a strange one why would, I, why would Celtic not take that massive amount of money and I thought about that at the time and I think the reason being was because the people that were in control of Celtic, this was the first thrust towards them that they weren't going to be owning the club. And even though it was a massive amount of money, I think the fact that they had to give up Celtic mm. was too much for them. Do you think the power and the control thing was more important at that time, Matt? I think the power and the control thing was, and because it was the very first offer, it was probably a wee bit of a frightener for them that, mm. hang on a minute, we might not be in charge here. No matter the amount of money we're offered here, we can't give up this control and this this money and this power because it, it was a real family dynasty. Um, so Brian Dempsey, I think around about the 29th of... Um, Ferguson had had enough. After that, he'd had enough and he was going back to uh, Montreal. And uh, Brian Dempsey organised a surprise dinner for him with people that were involved, mostly all the money guys, uh, there was Jack Flanagan there, Eddie Keane, uh, sorry, Dominic Keane was there, um, Brian Dempsey, various other sort of business types. And Brian got in touch with me and says, would you like to come along? I says, what is it? He says, surprise party, St. Jerome Fergus, because he's fed up because of the, the £17.5 million pound offer being rejected. And he said, if you come along, you have to stand up and speak. <laughs> so I was like, right, okay. So it was couples and all the guys at the table all had to say what Celtic meant to them. Um, So I was sort of listening to all this and they're all sort of, you could tell they were Celtic fans, absolutely no doubt about it. Um, And, you know, they they were well healed, they they had money, these guys. And it came round to me and uh, just in front of me, or two or three in front of me was Fergus. And he stood up and he said... um, we should be proud of everything we've achieved as Celtic supporters because everything we've achieved in our lives, we've achieved without having to join any secret organisation to get there. And for that very fact, we should be proud of ourselves. And I was like, wow. And I'm thinking, I, I didn't think this wee guy was going to come out with this because I just saw Fergus as the money guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I scribbled that quote down in a napkin and that um, has now been used quite widely. Uh, I literally scribbled it from a pen out of my pocket onto a paper napkin at the table. Uh, And that quote has stuck with me forever. Um, So Fergus um, then went back and um, the battle continued with uh, Fergus being out of the picture. I have to say, although Brian Dempsey, you know, uh, didn't become part of the, the new Celtic, you know, Brian did a fantastic amount of work, um, you know, Pardon me. He'd said he's recently he'd spent seven hundred thousand pounds <throat> of his own money, um, you know, buying shares and, and getting a foothold there, and um, which he did, uh, and he really drove a fantastic campaign. Brian Brian's a great orator, and I, I always felt it was a real shame that, that he and Fergus fell out. You know, must have been either on March the fourth or March the fifth, um, because it certainly happened that weekend, and I always felt that was a real shame. Um, Brian was a great orator, Fergus wasn't a great orator, Fergus was a money man and he just, you know, said it as it was. Brian led things while Fergus was in Canada um, for a good part of that campaign, in fact right from there, from when he got involved, when he got kicked off the old board, um, he ran a great campaign 
uh, fronting everything that was to happen. It's just a shame he wasn't there at the end. Yeah, and we'll maybe touch on that or revisit that just in a in a short while, Matt. Uh, obviously, Brian Dempsey had been part of the board with the Kellys. There's a, there's quite a famous picture, isn't it? Is it Celtic smiles better, him and Michael Kelly yeah. together? Uh, obviously, that didn't work out too well. And then obviously him and Fergus also didn't work out in the end. But we'll get to that just shortly. I just want to touch on a few what I would call key events for Celtics for change before that, Matt. There was there was loads going on, you know, over the piece it was only what a six, seven month period of your life, but a lot condensed into that that short space of time. Um there's various PR things you spoke about, Hugh Pim Hugh Pim uh, comment on your, your PR work and there's various things that took place. Uh, a couple of stories you can pick up uh, wherever you want to, but Michael Kelly, first of all, there was a bit of a failed PR stunt from his point of view. I think he invited you into his office. He's in town. I believe there was some clandestine stuff going on, a tape recorder in your top pocket, that yep. kind of idea. So yep. tell us about that and some of the other PR uh, tactics that you deployed. Right, the tape, cord tape recorder, um, first thing is because I didn't trust him. Right. Um, and actually saved my bacon at the end of the day uh, by not trusting him in doing that. So he had a, a PR company, I think it was in Bothwell Street, and they invited me up one lunchtime. His, sec his secretary had phoned me and uh, said, Mike would like to speak to you. And, uh, I thought, well, I haven't really got anything in common with him. And he's, she says, uh, he'd, really, he'd like to put something towards you, which is beneficial to Celtic. So I went along and I was standing in the lift. <laughs> and it was the old days when you had these tapes, the wee micro tapes, and it was the only way of recording something. It wasn't like you had a phone or anything. And uh, I remember putting the tape on in the lift and I thought, wait, I need to be in and out of here in an hour because when this stops, it's going to click off. <laughs> and he's going, you know, I've got a tape in my pocket. <laughs> so, and then basically he said to me um, that uh, we'd like you to, uh, so I'm, I'm writing all this anti board stuff in the fanzine. I would like you to come in. I really admire the stuff that you write. You come from a real, you know, the heart of the Celtic fan and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, I could smell. <laughs> I could smell a set up right away. And he says, I'd like to come in and over the Christmas New Year period, we're going to do a bumper special in Celtic View. I'd like you to to write in the centre pages and about the fans and their feelings, etc. And I said, I kind of burst out laughing and I said, um, I mean, I actually found sitting in front of him quite surreal. It really was. And, and the conversation quite surreal. The whole thing was surreal. And I kind of smiled and I says, Is that never work? And he said, Why not? I says, Well, because look, we're doing everything and, you know, to get and do it in the Celtic view. I says, You know, we're very critical of Celtic view because <clears throat> the Celtic view is carrying the party lane that we're a bunch of malcontents and, you know, there's been snide references made to our group and to the fanzine mentality. So you know, why would I come in and do that? And he said, well, I just thought it'd be a really good idea and blah, blah, blah. So you know, I knew there was a background to this. And the background was, was to really, you know, was to put me down. It was to say, well, look at this guy, you know, he's he's running a campaign and against us, but now he's in working in the Celtic view. Mm -hmm. So uh, I said I said no to him and chatted away. So through it all, there's all sorts of chat going on and I'm sort of glancing at my watch going, Craig, it must be an hour up here. So <laughs> I was really wary of that click not to go off the tape. It's sitting in my top pocket, my jacket. And there's a cup of tea sitting on the table and I picked up the teaspoon and I started to tap the teaspoon off the side of the, the plate <laughs> as the tape was clicking off. And he was looking at me as I was sitting going, yeah, 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 well, you know. <laughs> Did that cover your tracks? Was that good enough? <laughs> that covered my tracks. And I, get, I just burst out laughing and I get down in the lift. Um, so uh, his last thing to me was, well, have a think about it. He was really persistent. I would think about it. I says, well, I've given you my decision now. I'm not interested. I won't be doing it. I could think about it all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, that night I went down to Heritage Pub. It was a Friday. Went down to Heritage Pub and I was telling the boys in the pub, my pals, etc. All this carry on. And then I got a, a call from a journalist at the Evening Times. And he says, uh, this is a couple of days later, I got a call from a journalist at the Evening Times. And he says, um, I hear that uh, you're, you've been approached to go and write in the Celtic view and and you've accepted Celtic's offer to do it. And I said, what? And the guy said, yeah, we're going to print this story in the Times. He said, uh, it's not doesn't look good for you. I says, well, I tell you, that ain't the case. And he says, well, can you prove it? I said, yeah, I can prove it. Mm -hmm. And he said, how can you prove it? I says, well, because I taped the entire conversation. That's why I can prove it. I says, well, Michael Kelly's a liar. Mm -hmm. And Michael Kelly's trying to set me up here. And he's trying to use the newspapers to do it. And within an hour, 
I was in the office and I let them hear the tape and they ran a front page Michael Kelly tries to smear Celtic fan yeah and that's horrendous PR for them absolutely so it's backfired and then some I mean just in term, terms of when he but, but sorry just, that just gives you an idea of what we're up against mm. and how you had to take protective steps for yourself and that's why you had to tape yeah. to protect yourself absolutely was there any temptation at that time so obviously you, you mentioned early in the meeting you suspected something was up type thing but were you ever tempted to take the approach of you know, to use the saying, better to be inside the tent pissing out and all that stuff. Was there any temptation to take on that that role, that offer, and to get inside the inner workings of the club and maybe try and work your way through there? No, it, it was alien to me. I, I, I couldn't sit down. In those days, it was word processors didn't, didn't have computers. I couldn't sit down and write one line with that mentality. I, I, I just wasn't even a question for me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, life was difficult. I remember one day I went up to my mum's my mom's house and it was right. And really, my mum didn't know much about football. And um, um, I was kind of down at the time. And, you know, I'm not I'm quite, generally quite an upbeat, positive person. I was really kind of down. She says to me, what's up with your face? You know, sort of <laughs> Glasgow saying. And I just says, oh, the pressure of the campaign is really getting to me. I've got pressure in the house and pressure in the street and pressure in the pub, pressure in my head. I'm feeling the whole thing is really difficult. I don't know if I can carry on. This was quite near the end. And she grabbed me. My mom was a wee woman from Govan. She grabbed me and she says, don't you ever come in here. <laughs> Get a wee bit emotional, think about it. Don't you ever come in here. And with that defeatist attitude again, you go out there and carry on that campaign. Now on you go and push me out the door. And that was the inspiration for the rest of the campaign. That inspiration was a jag. That's great to hear, Mark. Really good to hear. I think I probably went outside and cried in the car. <laughs> <laughs> but not in front of your mum. No. Um, so, yeah, so we mentioned the PR side of things, Matt. You know, the various tactics mm -hmm. you deployed. The, the back of the team sack the board, which is, whether it's yourself or someone else, a, a genius kind of tagline as such. Um, there's other things, I think, on mass you ran at the Bank of Scotland at, at George Square to try and yep. speak to the manager. Is there a, is there a story there? Yeah, well, th that uh, meeting uh, was called for... Um, uh, a mobilisation of fans it's a difficult one because it was during the week and fans had um, had work to go to obviously we, we'd got banners and placards made and it says Bank of Scotland stop backing up a bankrupt club figures my can Celtic's friend for life which was Bank of Scotland slogan Bank of Scotland friend for life we said Fergus McCann friend for life kind of thing and um, it was at Govan Town Hall and um the Government Town Hall meeting was, uh, I'd got hold of Michael Kelly's phone number at this point. This was before he had called me. Um, and I'd said to the crowd, you know, I've got his phone number. <laughs> I think we should phone him at home from the stage and uh, ask him for a comment because they wouldn't speak to us. They, they blocked us at every opportunity. They smeared us. Uh, the whole thing was a joke. Um, so I phoned him up at the house and uh, in front of a government town hall, probably about 700 people. And I said, hi, he's, uh, I, I said along the lines, hi, Michael, it's Matt McGloney here. I'm on stage at government town hall. There's 750, 800 people here. Um, we were like an answer from you as to what your proposals are to do to get Celtic out of this situation. And he said to me, can the crowd hear me? And the crowd couldn't hear him um, in those days. You know, mobile phones just come out and they were like big, you know, come in, Z Victor one, all that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> a foot long phone thing. Mm -hmm. and, and they couldn't hear him. I said, No, they can't hear you. I says, But they can hear me and I'll translate what you're saying. And he says, No, I don't wish to comment. He says, But have a nice evening. So the next day we had made a plan prior to that government meeting uh, to go to the bank and put pressure on the bank. Now, sales for change were steadfast. We were determined. And nothing was putting us off, despite all the smears and the carry-on, nothing was putting us off. And where that energy and that came from, from the five guys in the group, I, I can't tell you, because there is no handbook for it, there's no manual. It, it it just was a synergy that happened. So the next day, we went to the bank and we asked as many people to turn up in George Square as possible. The Bank of Scotland head office at the time was what the Counting House pub is now in George Square. And uh, myself and David Cunningham went into the bank and we had no particular plan. We probably hadn't even thought of getting into the bank, but the fact that we were standing outside it and the crowd were chanting, the police quickly arrived and, 
Yeah, they were sort of around, didn't really know what to do because there was probably three or four hundred people there. There was like a flash flash mob kind of thing. I went into the bank and I asked the girl if you speak to the manager and she kind of looked at me like, who are you? And I actually was a customer at the time and I said, I'm a customer of the bank, I'd like to speak to the manager. And she says, no, I can't speak to the manager. And I said, well, I'd like to speak to somebody in charge. And she says, um, no, that, that won't be possible. What's this about? And I, she obviously heard the noise outside. I says, well, there's about 450 people outside. I says, um, and I just thought this up literally within standing speaking to her. It was no pre-plan in my head. I just said, well, so I'm thinking we're getting closed down here. What do we do to get out of this situation? How do we not get closed down here and walk back out the bank? I said, well, if, if we can't speak to somebody and it's a very serious matter, I'm going to ask all the people outside to come in and open up a bank account with a pound note and then queue again and close it down and get their pound back. And she looked at me like I was from a different planet. And I kind of went like that. I'm serious. And about 10 minutes later, we were in the manager's office having a cup of tea and a custard cream. Tea and biscuits all around. Uh, how did that meeting go? Was there tension there or what was the gist he, of that? He, Well, he said um, the very fact that we had made it in there was a coup. There's n- absolutely no doubt about it because we knew that both Scottish news TV channels were waiting outside. Um, and he said to me, listen, he said, um, I don't really know much about football. He says, I see you got a lot of people outside. Um, I can he says, I know what you're what you're doing. He said, and you you seem both reasonable guys. He says, but I can't discuss Celtic's account because it's it's a private matter. He said, but what I will do is I'll take all the notes of what you're saying to me. What we said to him was, you know, we're not a bunch of ruffians, we're not a bunch of hooligans. We're concerned Celtic fans, and we're asking the bank to look at the reason they're constantly giving Celtic money that they can't pay back. My great fear and the rest of the guys' great fear was if we are in such hawk to the bank, when the day comes and it's going to be soon when they can't pay their bills, the bank are going to run Celtic. Mm. Look what happened to Rangers when that happened. Charles Green, all these characters coming in. No, just carpetbaggers, just coming in to get what they could out of the club. And uh, so the guy took notes and it was really good. We came out and were that... We were on STV and BBC that night, uh, giving out the message that um, we went into the bank and we told the manager it was a serious situation and uh, that, that was a great coup for us. We, we didn't tell him anything. There was nothing said confidentially at the meeting because you couldn't talk confidentially about somebody else's account, which mm-hmm. was Celtic football clubs. But we told him that he listened to our, our uh, points and that he listened to our grievances and uh, you know he, he's, he said he would take them on board and he would make a report back to the the head of the bank. Yeah, just a, another uh, important PR piece for you though, Matt, and obviously it kind of creates the headlines and, and gets the, the people on board. Um, the next big move, obviously there's lots of stuff going on, as I say, a very intense, you know, six, seven months yourself in the group. But the next big move is what became the boycott. And I know you've pointed out that you were reluctant in the early stages, and I can understand that before people even really know who you and the guys are and what you're trying to achieve. It might have been too soon for a boycott that might have, you know, it would, have, it would have scuppered the campaign. Yeah. Because yeah, nobody knew who we were, you know. There was something last week in the in the media and it was using the Celts for Change logo. Mm-hmm. It was none of the guys in Celts for Change. It used our logo and it said, you know, do this, do that. But, you know, there was there that was out last week and it's disappeared. You know, so that, that kind of shows you the effect of that. So whoever was doing that last week, they actually used our logo, which is a bit cheeky, you know, and, you know, there was no name to it, you know, the very first meeting, I stood up and I says, my name is Matt McGlone. When all the guys joined the group, there was Brendan, then there was Davey, and then there was John, and then Colin Duncan in that order, because we didn't have a group of five at that time, because we weren't organised. People gravitated towards, can I help? Mm-hmm. And that was the main thing. That's how the group was formed, the five people. But this thing last week, you know, I'm not talking about the rights and wrongs of what we said in it, but what I'm saying is if you ha- if you do something like that, you have to put your name to it. You have to say, this is who we are. Now, just back to your point there, that's why we couldn't uh, do a boycott at the time because people knew who we were, but they didn't know our aims and we had to go around supporters clubs. We had to go to Ireland. We did a, a meeting on a ferry from Belfast to Larne. I mean, real hard work. It was total hard work. Not just doing the job, uh, and at the time, you always thought, you know, you're 
you're sort of peeing against the wind here because everything you're doing, you know, you're keeping the momentum going, but you're not actually getting anywhere because they're still in control and it doesn't look like they're going to crack. So we had to keep a steady resolve to make sure that we could keep this going. So you couldn't call for a boycott in November 93 because people didn't know who we were. We had to go out and work hard and tell people who we were. Yeah, and, and a lot of work between November and the, the March, ultimately, you know, meetings, city halls, Shettleson Town Hall, Govan Town Hall, you've mentioned, over in Dundalk, I believe, meetings on the ferry, all these kind of things, lots of hard work and energy, just to make sure that, I suppose, first and foremost, the visibility was there and people could get to know you, hopefully get to like you, but certainly get to trust you, you know, to, to use that maxim. And I think even likes of the example you gave, Matt, from last week, I'm sure there's merit in some of the things that the that group were saying, but if they're faceless and nameless, you're going to struggle to get people to follow you with whatever you're trying to achieve, and I think that's the difference. Yeah, well, I'm not uh, going to comment on what, the, the, what they were saying in it. The point I'm making here is that if you put a leaflet out, you have to say who you are. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, and just cover a couple of things there. Um, we had a, a meeting. Um, it was difficult to have a meeting in Belfast um, because of probably the politics and the the... The, the, the sort of situation that was going on in the north at the time mm -hmm. um, so we decided that uh, it's because you had to have a big place the security involved etc there was lots of things happening there um, so it was thought that the best way to do that was to, to as to do that as in being having a meeting with Celtic sports clubs from the north of Ireland was to do it en route to, in a ferry <laughs> from Belfast to Larne now, this was done, I think it was New Year's Day the day after. What could possibly go wrong, Matt? And what could possibly go wrong? Um, the crowd were in front of us, and uh, generally, a, you know, a meeting at the city halls, at government town halls, you'd have 10 feet between you and the crowd. Here you had, you know, five inches from the guy out his face, you know, celebrating New Year um, in a very nice kind of way. But you're trying to conduct a, a meeting. Um, it was all good natured. Um, a couple of times, some people jumped up and tried to pull a neck, Mike out my hand. You know, I'll tell you what's happening, mate. And I said, no, hang on, mate. We're here to do a specific message here. So we got it done. We then, it was it was quite a meeting. But there was loads of Celtic Sports Clubs represented there because they're all travelling over mm -hmm. for the game. We then held one in Dundalk, uh, just over the border. Uh, and I think there was 52 delegates from Celtic Sports Clubs in Ireland. So this was a very important meeting. Mm -hmm. And at this particular meeting, all the guys stood up and spoke. It was quite a long, it was a long meeting. All the guys stood up and spoke. And there was uh, 51 delegates there. And at the end of it, uh, they had a vote. Would these 51 Celtic, this is crucial for Ireland, would these 51 Celtic Sports Clubs back Celts for change? So... Out of the 52 delegates that were there, 51 said yes, and the other one said, I have to go back to speak to my club. Mm -hmm. well, I'll do that tonight, and you'll get the, the vote, you'll get the decision in the morning. The morning came, and we get 52 out of 52. What a boost that gave the lads, the campaign, and it was utterly fantastic because the Evening Times was on to me the next morning and said to me, um, How did that go yesterday? I said, 52. Celtic Sports Clubs represented 52 out of 52. It was massive for the group, massive. And, and that was them uh, voicing their support for you as a group or for a boycott specifically? That was them uh, voicing support for us as a group and backing our aims of the group. Um, can't remember the exact specifics at that time, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, as to had we said a date for a boycott, but we'd certainly have said in the meeting that they uh, were aiming towards a boycott. Yeah. You know. Okay, great support. Must so, have been you know, boost. back to, just to cover that original question, that's why we couldn't call for a boycott early doors. That's why it's pivotal that we had to do the hard miles yeah. to get the support. Yeah, it wouldn't have worked in September, October 93, but obviously fast forward to what we're about to cover, uh, March 1994. So I think, first of all, the game you had planned towards, did snow scupper your plans? It snowed and the uh, Celtic had means um, for, uh, you know, not allowing snow on the park. Um, there was a big, massive amount of, there was a massive amount of publicity that there'd be a boycott of this match and you couldn't make it up. It snowed the afternoon before the game. But St Mirren's game, uh, they played at Love Street at the time. It was only about eight miles down the road. Their game was on. 
Um, so that was a, you know, bit of a <laughs> bit of a blow because there's been so much preparation done for it. But I think the league rules at the time were that uh, the game had to be replayed the next following midweek, and and it was. And um, the board were putting out messages at the time that if 10,000 people plus were at the game, then Celts for Change had failed. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, 10,000 plus was a signal that, uh, you know, the fans weren't into Celts for Change and we could all go back to our peripheral housing schemes that we were told we came from, you know. And you've then taken what I think proved to be a really pivotal approach to that game, Matt, you've, through the funds and the support of the, the people who have backed Celtics for Change, you've employed a customer research company to attend that game. So if there's any more than 10,000 at the game, strict, you know, give or take, it's deemed a success for the, the club. Anything less than 10,000 in there and bother. So tell us how that played out in terms of the the work that was done on that night. Well, I, I, I suppose there's uh, key points and this was another major key point. I came up with an idea that... Um, we, we obviously couldn't trust the board because we'd seen their, their previous attempts at uh, smearing the group. Um, so uh, it had been historically known that Celtic's figures for uh, attendances <laughs> were less than accurate, let's say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm being diplomatic here. I was at the game against uh, Dundee in 1988 when we won the league yeah. and uh, there was fans all sitting round the side of the pitch on the track and they gave out the official figure that day. So there you go. So we had, we had good reason not to trust them. Um, uh, I looked about, these are very early days um, for market research companies and things being prevalent in society. Um, uh, but I found a company called Scott Search Limited. Um, they were a Glasgow-based uh, market research company. I remember the chat with Brendan, I said, how much money we got left in the bank account? We had uh, we'd appeal, we had money in the account to buy, uh, to buy banners, posters, and pay for halls. The city halls was, I think it was £480 for the city halls every second Sunday. Mm-hmm. We we literally campaigned every second Sunday from October right through to early March. Um, so all that had to be paid for. We got a couple of pass keepers out, local chapels that people knew, trustworthy folk, went round with buckets, picked up the money. Brendan and I were the, um, we were the signatories in the bank account. We obviously then he put it in a Scottish bank. We we put it in the Allied Irish Bank, which was in St Vincent's Place at the time, I think. I said to him, how much I think we got left? He said about 800 quid. And I think Scott Search says to us, um, it's about, I can't remember, maybe more than that. I can't remember the exact amount. It was more than what we had. Um, so I said, right, I asked them to do, if they could put a, a person on each, each turnstile and count every single person that went in for the planned boycott game. Um, and they said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And I said, listen, how, how quickly can you get the figures back to me? I really need them the next day, the next morning. And say, yeah, we can do that. We can do it that night. And, you know, there's no emails or anything at the time. We'll phone you and tell you then. We'll give you a document by lunchtime, an official document, telling you how many people enter Celtic Park that night. I said, right, okay, that's great. So the fact we had an independent company doing it, who did it, that's their business. Mm-hmm. We were very confident. Um, that afternoon, um, uh, ITN in London had got in touch with me and says we'd like to go up to STV Studios uh, to do uh, an interview live to London on the lunchtime news from London, which has been seen by maybe 30, 40 million people. So um, did that, I think the guy's name was Peter Sissons, I'm not quite sure, it might have been him. And uh, he was asking me about the boycott, etc. <clears throat> and this is on the day of the boycott. I'm obviously very hyped up because there's a lot riding on this um, and I'm trying to show a bit of composure and not take the bait because journalists tend to throw you a line to lead you down another avenue and I was determined that wasn't going to happen and he did and he said to me, you can concerned Celtic fans, he says, but you know, surely asking fans not to go to the game, this is going to damage the club more than anybody else could. And I says, no, we are concerned Celtic fans, I says, and we are not the people who are damaging this club. We are the lifeblood of this club. The people who are damaging this club are the people that are running into debt who are going to have the reins of Celtic maybe owned by a bank. And we are trying to stop that. And we don't want to do this. I said, we don't want to have a boycott, but we're doing this. It's a one-off, it's a one-off situation. And, you know, it's, uh, one piece of pain for lots of gain. 
that that kind of phrase. And he said, I said, I also said, if any Celtic fans are going to the game tonight, that's fine, absolutely fine. But what I ask you to do if you're going to go to the game is to examine his or her conscience about going to the game and what we are trying to do. I said there'll be, and they said, what about your crowd? I said, no, they won't be outside Celtic Park. We've we'll appealed to fans in Celtic for change. Uh, through the media and various sources that we had to contact fans not to turn up at the game. If you're not going to the game, please don't turn up at the game. We don't want any confrontation at all among Celtic fans. And that was key. The last thing we want is riots, fighting, scuffles, you know, scenes outside Celtic Park. And thankfully, the people that were boycotting didn't turn up at the game. And the people that went to the game, fair play to them, they're entitled to go to the game. I only asked them if they could examine their conscience for this one game. And um, the following day, the board came out and said, I think there was a crowd of about 12,000. They put out a statement right away. Sales for Change protest group, you know, blah, blah, blah. Didn't work out. Had luck. So um, I phoned up Scott Search and they said, we've got the figures. Went up at lunchtime to their office, picked up this official document. And it said there was 8,225 at the game. Um, Hazel Irvin, who down in London uh, now, she was uh, working for BBC Scotland at the time and she was kind of the person assigned to the, the BBC sport thing for, she dealt with most of the sales for change thing. It's a very good relationship with Hazel and, you know, she, she accurately reported what we were doing. So she phoned me up and she says, hi Matt, the board are saying 12,500 at the game. And I said, that's not the case. I says, the boycott was successful. I says, 8,225 people attended that game. And she says, uh, can you prove that? I said, yeah. Um, I said, we, we got a market research company to count every single person who went in. I says, I can actually tell you who went in what gate. I've got, I've got detailed figures. And out of the 8,225 that were at the game, uh, there was 1,905 Kilmarnock fans. So, you know, you're talking roughly just over 6,000 people attended the game. Mm -hmm. No problem with that. They're absolutely entitled to go to the game. Um, so she says, uh, would you come on TV tonight with the document? And I said, yeah. I went up to BBC Scotland. And, uh, you know, it's very important to do these things because you have to prove what's right. You have to prove that they're telling lies. So I went up and I held up the document and I said, this market research company. And um, the next day, the bank had watched all this unfold the bank the next day had a meeting and they said to sell, take games up, you owe us money, we want it in 24 hours. And the board panicked and um, they didn't have the money. And they says by March the 4th, midday, you have to come up with one million pounds. And obviously the board didn't have a million pounds. And uh, the one million pound was part of the debt that was owed to the Bank of Scotland. They wanted their money back first. Mm -hmm. Now, if they hadn't, if, sell, if the one million pound hadn't been paid on March the 4th, then Celtic would have broken an agreement with the bank and the bank would then have been in control of Celtic. Some kind of receivership situation leading to liquidation and, and worse. Um, fortunately, because of the campaign and fortunately because of people like Brian Dempsey and, and um, Fergus McCann and also Willie Hawkey and Gerard and Michael all these pressure points of people that had money, the money was going to be paid, but Celtic couldn't pay it. So therefore, enter the rebels on March the 4th. Fergus flew in overnight. He lived in Montreal. He was living in the winter in Scottsdale, Arizona. He flew over overnight. He went up um, to his bank. In those days, no, inter no internet transfers, no online transfers. Things were all done very difficult. Made it down to the Bank of Scotland um, down at George Square at 11.52 and he deposited £1 million into Celtic's bank account. Now, when you think about that, <clears throat> this is a very tricky, precarious position because what he's done is he's put in a million pounds, say, into your bank account or into mine. Mine, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he put it into Celtic's bank account and uh, had still had nothing to do with the club. Mm -hmm. And I'm not me meaning to be too dramatic here in, in creating headline type stuff, Matt, but is it is it as serious as it sounds? We're Celtic eight minutes from extinction. Is that the, yes. the bottom line? There's, there's absolutely no, no doubt about it. I think that fact is, is probably missed a wee bit nowadays because, you know, 30 years have moved on 
and the younger fan wasn't around at the time. So you to know what was really happening today, you would have to be 40, 49, 50, because then you'd be 18, 19, 20. Mm-hmm. Um, so the younger fan knows about what happened back in the day, but I don't think they know how crucial it was. Celtic Football Club, as we know it today, would not have existed had the bank not had that money paid in on March the 4th. That is key, that is very crucial. And they also wanted another three and a half million by the following Wednesday. So that was quite crucial as well. So what what unfolded was the game is up for the board, but they're still sitting there thinking, well, you know, we're still here because Fergus put money into our account. Mm. A very strange situation. Who would who would do that? But Fergus knew that to keep it out of the clutches of the bank and any other financial institution who would say we're going to get a bit of this, we'll pay the money, you know, and it wouldn't be in Celtic's hands or a Celtic fan's hands. And Cer- Fergus was most certainly a big Celtic fan. Mm. Uh, Fergus went up there and they had meetings, and in those meetings was uh, Brian Dempsey, David Lowe, um, Fergus, um, a uh, Jack Flanagan, who was a Glasgow bar owner at the time, as part of the sort of Scottish consortium to help save Celtic. Um, um, Dominic Keane, people like that. Now the way it transpired at the end, um, some of the board members um, wanted money for their shares. Now there's a phrase that goes around which emanates from Fergus, and that phrase is "I won't give you one thin dime." And Fergus was presented with this situation that some of the people on the board wanted money for a club that was bust. Mm -hmm. Now, had the bank taken over Celtic, these people would have got nothing. Fergus put the money in, and Fergus was reminded at that meeting on March the 4th, Fergus, you put a million pounds into our bank account. Now, you can imagine Fergus was actually livid hearing the way this chat was going, and these people wanting money from him. Mm -hmm. So as it turned out, certain board members took money and they sold their shares to to Fergus. I suppose it shows the the real impact, Matt, of of the boycott. The boycott, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, was absolutely your, the biggest card you could play, but it was important to play it at the right time. And we've already discussed how you couldn't have done it too soon in the Silks for Change campaign. But at that time, you know, the midweek, second of March game, that was the right time. And the subsequent proof that you could say, listen, there was 8,000 or, or 6,000 Celtic fans or whatever. That was a catalyst because I think that proved that it, it would have cost the club somewhere between 150 and 200 grand, you know, in terms of lost revenue and different things just on that that gate alone. And that's obviously what alerted the Bank of Scotland the night of or the morning after to say, we need to take action. So it's obviously, it's had its desired effect, but beyond the, the boycott, there was still work to be done between Fergus and the, the powers that be to get things over the line. Yeah, uh, from Friday, March the 4th. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, certain directors uh, took money uh, for their shares. Other directors that didn't take money from Fergus um, were um, Jimmy Farrell, Jack McGinn, uh, Tom Grant and Kevin Kelly, which left you Michael Kelly, Christopher White and David Smith. David Smith was put onto the Celtic board during or just before the campaign started uh, as a sort of figurehead businessman who was giving Celtic um, business advice um, under because they were under pressure. As it turned out, David Smith was an employee of the Bank of Scotland and he was in there looking after their cash. Mm-hmm. So the crux for the old board was they couldn't not... Um, They couldn't turn around and say to Fergus, well, no, we're not doing a deal. On you go, good evening. You've just put more into your account. Because they knew that other money had to be paid. And if the bank took over, those people would get nothing. Mm -hmm. So to do a deal with Fergus when he said, won't give them one thing down. What I'm told is that Fergus was, I wasn't there uh, in that room. But I was told by people that were in the room that Fergus was raging. That they wanted money for a club that was bust. They were shameless. Absolutely shameless. And... um, he had to be taken out of the room, calmed down, spoken to and said, look, you're going to have to give them some amount of money here. That money, I believe, was, was in excess that I'm told, allegedly, was over a million pounds. To appease the those who were digging their to, heels in? To appease those who were digging their heels in, it said, remember you put a million pounds into our bank account. Mm. 
Yeah, shameless stuff if if that's proven to be the case. Um, so by the following Wednesday, there had to be uh, another three and a half million put in because uh, the bank were wanting paid right away before MDA else was wanting paid. So for Fergus to have total control and no financial institution buying Celtic or a bank getting hold of Celtic, that other three and a half million pound had to be paid. And um, Willie Hockey got in touch with me and said to me that um, if you could give Fergus a phone, tell him that Michael and I will put half a million pound in each mm -hmm. right now. We'll give them the money right now. And they, they, they bought in right away. Willie was in right away. John Keane... Um, um, who's not part of Eddie Keane or Dominic Keane it's a different family mm -hmm. John Keane who uh, put money in I think believe over a million pound there was a guy Albert Friedberg I think he was he was a financier that Fergus knew from back home and Fergus put more money in and any debt owned to the bank was paid the following Wednesday there's a lot of work to be done because from there on in all the debt had to be paid Fergus felt that every single person had to be paid I know the face painter wasn't paid across the road and the guy that's a news agent down the road, they were all stung. Fergus McCann made sure that every single person that was owed money, not by him, but because he'd bought over the debt, mm -hmm. he was going to honour it. And there is that famous quote from Fergus and I should have had it in front of me, but basically, yeah, it's along the lines of we could have taken an easier route here, we could have liquidated and started again for nothing, but we felt it was right to pay the, the, the different creditors and that's exactly what we've done. I mean, the, the famous line, Matt, of course from the night of 4th of March, is Brian Dempsey fronting things outside the stadium. Quote-unquote, the game is over, the Rebels have won. A couple of questions I'd like to ask you about that. Um, I think I've heard the story that, first of all, he wanted to say the battle is over, and Fergus said, no, make it the game, because it's been a game, it's been a bit of mm -hmm. back and forth, a bit of gamesmanship. But why do you think it was Brian Dempsey, who I don't think put up money on that occasion, it was Fergus McCann who fronted the £1 million. Why was it Brian Dempsey and not Fergus McCann making that big statement on the ste steps of Celtic Park? Well, because at that time, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, Brian was a fantastic orator. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the mic, you know, Brian would stand up and say, it's not what your club can do for you, famous John F. Kennedy speech. Mm -hmm. It's what you can do for your club. And I remember hearing that, and I had hairs going up the back of my neck. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not what the club can do for you, it's what you can do for your club. And that was very important. So Brian was a great orator, and as I said earlier, he did carry the campaign right through while Fergus was in, was abroad. Um, so at that particular point, um, you know, no sort of major deals had been done as what was happening on the way forward. We're still on the evening of March the 4th, 1994. We're still on that evening. So Brian being the, the, the speaker, I don't know why he was chosen to do it, but he was always the front man. But Fergus also spoke that night. Mm -hmm. He said along the lines of it's uh, a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new beginning for Celtic Football Club. And I'll promise you, I'm paraphrasing here, but I promise you that we will do our very best for the very best people who support this club. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it was a great statement. Yeah. And Fergus has got that reputation, Matt, you know, being a hard-nosed, cutthroat business type, you know, very serious kind of guy. You've mentioned how, you know, angry he was in, in the meeting room on the, the 4th of March at Celtic Park. But I believe, and I think it's maybe in your, your own book or somewhere else I've read, that he also had a, a pretty sharp sense of humour and he could be, you know, light-hearted and humorous when it came to it. Aye, Fergus was a one-liner. Um, he, was, he was an absolute one-liner. Um, I remember, I think I actually only met Fergus five times in the five years after that night. And remember one time when I was working in there, I chapped his door for something that I needed clarification on that I was writing. And he said to me, <coughs> what do you want? And he had a pile of papers up there and a pile of papers up there. And he was going through all these files and he was in at seven in the morning, leaving at nine or ten at night. And he said, he said to me, uh, right, you've got one minute, right? And so there's no time for small talk. Like, how are you doing, Fergus? Right, you've used up five seconds there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but he was he was very sharp, very very funny guy. He was a very funny guy. Uh, he was much maligned by the Scottish media. You remember the headline: "The most hated man." There was a picture of him and Saddam Hussein. You know, it was absolutely shocking. <coughs> um, large sections of the Scottish media couldn't stomach what was done. Mm. They couldn't stomach it. Yeah, and just find it hard to... 
they they just pulverised him um, because he's a small guy, you know, didn't have a major presence about him. Brian was a, had a major presence about him. Um, Fergus just wanted to get on with the job and, and, and do the work. Yeah, and I think he was wise enough for the Scottish media as well. We've heard various quotes over the years. Um, so obviously there's a lot of stuff which we'll kind of breeze past just now, uh, just in the interest of time, Matt, but... Brian Dempsey doesn't last too long in the new regime at all. I think within a matter of days of 4th of March, it's not worked out between him and Fergus. They've gone their own ways. And then obviously, uh, in 1995, Fergus turns the club into a PLC and floats it on the London Stock Exchange, deemed one of the most successful share issues in football, I believe, at the time, certainly. Generated something in the region of £21 which was used to redevelop Celtic Park and to provide working capital for the club. Uh, What then followed in terms of on-the-pitch stuff... um, Success wasn't far away. William Janssen came in in 98, then a bit of a pause, and then you get Martin O'Neill coming in in the 2000s. And the rest kind of is history. You know, we've seen unprecedented success, you know, during those times in the last 24 years or so. Um, I suppose the question to you, in the early 90s, Matt, could you have ever pictured such success? I don't know, you can debate Celtic's European success, but domestically, Celtic dominate. Could you ever have seen that 30 odd years ago? With the amount of trophies we've won just now, and we have complete domination now. Um, I mean, we're heading for 10 in a row two seasons ago, or three seasons ago. We've won, we won two leagues since. Uh, so we've won 11 out of 12, roughly, is it? Mm-hmm. Um, umpteen cups. You know, this is a com- this has been a complete turnaround. Um, all to do, I think, with the way Celtic supporters have backed the club. Because any money that comes into Celtic doesn't come out of the current Celtic director's pockets. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's no major sugar daddy there like Jack Walker at Blackburn. The money that is generated at Celtic comes from season ticket money, buying merchandise, um, doing various things, um, various share issues at the club. The fans are backed. Um, So, you know, the the club are are in a a great financial situation just now. The the situation, something that saddened me a wee bit in the 90s was the relationship between Fergus and Tommy. You know, two Celtic guys that I knew very well and uh, I loved very well. Um, Tommy was a very emotional character, wore his heart in his sleeve. Fergus was a very sort of business type, structured planning type of guy. He knew that there were, had to be X amount of money put towards the team. Uh, but he also knew a, a 60,000 60, seater stadium had to be built. Mm. Now, we were getting crowds of between when it wasn't playing against Rangers. I think the week after we played Rangers during the sort of <clears throat> the Rebel days was a game at Ibrox and then the following week we played Partick this one that was 21,000 at the game so you know you weren't getting 60,000 crowds so this guy's building a stadium for maybe twice the amount of people he could hope to get mm-hmm. so but we can see the benefits that has today you know it's the biggest stadium in Scotland every game they play at Ibrox they've got 52,000 every game we play We've got 62,000. Mm-hmm. Do the sums. Three, three 350,000, whatever, coming in each fortnight more. So great, great planning there. F- Tommy obviously is under pressure um, to win the league. Um, Rangers are ready on the row, on the road to, to sort of towards nine in a row. We had done nine in a row. That was the first nine in a row that was almost going to equal what we were doing. Worse had they done it. Mm-hmm. Um, but to equal it, that was the first stop. We didn't want that to happen, but obviously it did. So Tommy's priorities were the team. And I can totally understand that. Fergus's priorities is balancing the books. Because what you have to remember is, after Celtic almost going bust, Celtic were very cagey not to get near that situation again. And that situation again could have been perilously close had you overspent while you're financing the team and trying to build the stadium. Yeah, do you know, it, 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 I suppose it takes us right up to modern day, Matt, and I don't want to make this about the current Celtic board and, and, and what they're doing or not doing, but it's almost like they've gone so far from that situation. They're, whatever the opposite of teetering on the brink is, that's where we are now. We've got 67, 72 million, something like that in the bank. Just a very quick question, as I say, it's not to go into the, you know, the final detail of what's going on right now, but we are currently experiencing great domestic success. You can't debate that. But there is a saying that does the rounds, and we've repeated it on our podcast, that Celtic are a very well-run business, but not necessarily a very well-run football club. What would your own response to be to a, a statement like that? Well, 
I think we've just come through January and uh, a major disappointment in the transfer market. Everybody that supports Celtic knows that certain areas of that team need strengthened. That's a fact. We've got the money to strengthen and we didn't do it. That is very frustrating, really frustrating when we know we have the money there because across the road they'll throw everything at it. They'll borrow, they'll sell the kitchen sink, they'll borrow everything to try and win this league. We've got the money and I think we have taken our foot off the gas here. We should have strengthened big time in January. Um, at the current situation, time of this interview, we're two points behind. It was only a couple of months ago, we were eight points ahead. So I've had a deficit of 10 points. Uh, that tells you that there's something wrong. That tells you that this team is not as strong. This squad is not as strong as we think it is. My personal opinion is this current Celtic board have let the support down. We had ponied up with the money and they are sitting there with money in the bank, not using it. There's talk of 55, 60 million pound to be earned getting into the Champions League next year, uh, this, this current year. We are putting that in mortal danger at the minute. It's very dicey because we can't sign any other players. We can't strengthen the team just now. And I feel that Celtic should have not pushed the boat out, spent money they do have and strengthened the team. I've got to wholeheartedly agree, Matt. I think, I think Celtic can and I think they will win this league. But the bottom line is we've gambled with it and, and that's the real frustration. Final question on, on the current situation. It's, it's a fairly pointed question. Do you see any familiar patterns with the current board in comparison to what you were seeing back in 1990 or is it a completely different ball game these days? It's a completely different ball game these days because these were a couple of families that were really running Celtic. <clears throat> and these families... These board members back then had decisions to make that they were culpable for or responsible for. We're now run basically by one guy and I don't believe this board will overrule that one guy. Mm -hmm. So the board then could make decisions and be culpable for them. The board now are not making decisions because one guy is making the decisions at Celtic. Um, and that's the problem you have nowadays. Um, what we need is a vibrant board. We need a younger board. We need a board. I certainly think we need you know fans representation on the board. Um, somebody much younger, who's vibrant, who can put forward ideas, um, who uh, has a structure to their thinking, uh, and the people on the board. They. I often wonder what kind of conversations they have with each other about one guy telling them what's happening. Because we hear stories that somebody in the board wanted that manager, the assistant at Manchester City, mm. and someone who's now at Leicester, and somebody else wanted um, Brendan, um, but the major power guy, he got his, his own way. So that is not healthy. It's a different kind of unhealthiness, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a different situation, but I suppose in different ways, still a concerning situation. And, and I don't doubt there's intelligent people on the Celtic board, but it certainly lacks a bit of diversity, Matt, and, and maybe some younger heads there and some fresh thinking. There's been some people, I'm not sure if it's best practice in terms of corporate governance to have people so long on any given board because it you know doesn't promote fresh thinking. And you're, you're absolutely right. So the individual you, you speak of is Dermot Desmond, who was brought in by Fergus, I think. You know, they obviously had an agreement at the time when Fergus moved on. And I don't think it's a healthy position when you've got such a controlling individual which kind of nullifies any creative thinking the current board may even be having. It, it kind of really defeats the purpose of having your board if they can't, you know, yeah. operate in a proper way. Well, the controlling individual can come from Qatari. He can come from Bangkok. He can come from Indonesia. He can come from Dublin. Now, without knowing... You know, who was who? The person that came in came from Ireland and, and we obviously have a strong affiliation with Ireland. Um, any shares, as far as I understand this, I think I'm probably right here, but any shares that weren't taken up by the supporters were offered to uh, Dermot Desmond. Mm. I think that's how that came about. Um, so obviously, you know, the fans don't have deep pockets. You know, they're all working class people with different bills to pay and families to look after. So there's only there's only so many shares the average supporter can buy. Yeah. 
And then when those shares weren't taken up, um, then they were offered to Dermot Desmond. And that's why he's in that situation. But there's other there's other big players in there who are not on the board um, who have major amounts of shares. You know, I would I would pose this question, you know, between the devil and the deep blue sea, uh, you have to know who's coming in to replace somebody that you maybe currently don't like. You have to know the strength of the person that's coming in. And we don't know that. That's the question we can't answer. And that's the question I've posed. Is it better the devil, you know, in terms of Dermot Desmond? Or should Celtic be looking in a different direction? But what I'll do, Matt, I'll bring it back. You know, obviously this is all about 1994, so maybe it's a wee bit unfair of me to sink the boot into the current board. That's not the intention. But I think it's important while I had you in the room, Matt, to, well, I, I to think it, I think it's relevant to today's conversation. Yeah. And, you know, you asked the question, are there parallels? And, uh, you know, I think there's an unhealthiness with uh, having one particular strong shareholder to, it's a different type of unhealthiness yeah. to what we had previously no it's, it's all fair comment in, in that aspect but a final question for you um, at the end of your own book Emotionally Celtic which I've read in the last few days you asked your four other Celtics for change members Brendan Sweeney Colin Duncan David Cunningham John Thompson if they would do it all over again so the answer you know, that they gave was varied and there's no doubt at all about the stresses and tolls it took on the lives of all involved but here we are, 30 years later. I'll ask you our final question for today. Would you do it all over again? <laughs> wow, what a loady question that is. <laughs> uh, I would do it all over again if I didn't know all of the pitfalls and all the strains and stresses and relationship. There was a major relationship in my life which, which took a dive due, due to it, which could have been something that lasted longer. Um, well... I have to be honest and say, could I put myself through all that again? No. Um, if I was in the same position today, not known of all the grief that it would cause, would I do it? I'd probably say yes, because I now have knowledge of the massive effect it's had on me as a person in my life. I've had a, a few mental health struggles due to it, um, I, and relationships taking a dive. I've got family and various ways that can uh, change Change me as a person. I don't think I could go through that again. Revolution, a young man's game, Matt, is that what you're telling uh, me? Well, yeah, yeah revolution, if, if you want to call it that. Do we need a revolution? I, I don't know if we need a revolution. I think what we need is, we need is younger, forceful thinkers with a, a strategy, with a plan. But most of all, a love for the club, that the end game in your plan is the love for the club. It's mm. not how much you can make out it. It's not how many shares you can buy. It's what can you do for your club? Back to what Brian Dempsey says. Yeah. What can you really do for your club? If your main aim is to do your best for Celtic and you're younger and thrustful, then, you know, get involved, do something. I always say that no matter what's going on at the club, younger people should stand up and and do what's best for their club. Yeah, do you know, I think that's a, a perfect note to finish on, Matt. Matt, thanks, first of all, for being so frank with your answers and a huge thanks for joining us here in the Celtic Exchange and sharing the story of, of what's obviously a very pivotal time in your life. Uh, thanks, of course, to all who supported you and, and all who played their part 30 years ago and ultimately doing what they did to save Celtic because without it, we might not be sitting here talking about Celtic today. So again, Matt, thanks for joining us and all the very best. Thank you very much.